Okay, I'm going to get ready and get started today in the interest of time because I know it's spring break and we're going to get this recorded and out to everyone as soon as possible. But hi everyone, I'm my name is Emma Gibbons and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Volleyball BC. Um, and I am very excited to be here tonight um, with some exciting and interesting people to talk about the topic of self-care. So before we get going, I'd like to just acknowledge that I'm joining today from the traditional and, and ancestral territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, the Squamish Nation and the Musqueam. But we acknowledge that volleyball is played across this province and we're very grateful for that opportunity to do so. And um, joining us today, we have a couple of our mental health ambassadors. We've got Derek Tyson and Shanice Marcel, who are joining us, and they will be working alongside Shauna in delivering this presentation and adding their own um, personal experiences and tips for self-care. Um, and I'm going to acknowledge up front that Shanice is on a different time zone and may have to leave early and dip out. So we'll we'll glean what we can for her while she's with us. And so without further ado, I'd like to also introduce Dr. Shauna Taylor, who's the past chair of the Canadian Sports Psychology Association and works out of UBC in high performance coaching and leadership. She's also the executive director of Pacific Sport Okanagan, and she has worked very closely with us on the mental health toolkit and the resources that we've been bringing for everyone. So I would like to hand it over to Shauna and let her get started on this packed hour of tips and tricks on self-care. Um, and one final thing, if you do have any questions or comments, please post them in the chat or directly with me. I don't think it's fully working because I can't see everybody that has, um, I can. I think I can see you differently what, than the rest of the panel. And so um, I will moderate those for you, Shauna, and let you know if anyone has any questions. Oh, and you're, and you're muted. <laughs> Yeah, you know it's spring break when. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Okay, there we go. You can hear me. You can see me. Excellent. Um, yes, and I actually, I am coming uh, to you on, and, and I have the privilege of living, working, playing, and enjoying the beautiful environment here in the unceded traditional territory of the Salix Nation in the Okanagan Valley. My pronouns are she and her. And I'm really excited to have this last last webinar in a series. We have a few more coming up that are um, somewhat connected, but this was the, the third in a trilogy that we've been doing. And it's been so great having Shanice and Derek. And we think that we won't have anybody else joining us this evening due to some really big news potentially with our other <laughs> ambassador. Um, but on, on this note of self-care for mental well-being, especially in times that might be more stressful and trying. So that could be going into a playoff period. That could be if you're a student, and I know many athletes that are part of the Volleyball BC global family are also student athletes. So you're balancing a lot. You've got coaches that are also balancing other jobs and parents that are volunteers. And self-care is really something that I think all humans need to attend to more. It's not just um, unique to our sector, but we will be dividing it into four main categories or areas tonight and hoping to get some feedback from Shanice and Derek on some of the things that they have become more aware of over the years uh, in their playing career and then post post playing career as well. So talking about just a little more enhanced self awareness of where we are at with our mental health and well being and when it might be time to take a bit of a self care break or use it as a preventative measure, how we build this concept of resilience. So being able to sort of roll with the stressors of life and be able to have the resources and coping skills necessary to be able to manage a wide variety of stress and curveballs that come at us in your sport, literally and figuratively. Um, and then things like, you know, what is holistic wellness? Is, is it just about our mental health and managing emotions? Or what does that mean to really understand what holistic health and wellness is and it, it's a it's a pretty massive field so we're going to try to take a look at a couple models 
especially some that are more multicultural that might help inform us better. And then how do we plan for, are there tools out there? Are there trainings that you can take to get you a little more up to speed on how you might want to create your own self-care plan? This is in and out of the sports sector, but certainly a way that you could intersect your personal life with something you're passionate about, like your sport career and your volleyball playing career. I have mentioned this before, and I, I, I repurposed this slide from a webinar that I did around a year ago. It was on performance anxiety, Emma, you may remember, and how I, I have started to use different terminology over the years, or I try to have a variety of terms and different language that is not as stigmatizing to understanding more about mental health and, and wellness. And so there was a real push initially say two, three decades ago, really when the field of sports psychology and performance psychology was starting to get its footing in the sports sector. And we talked a lot about building mental toughness and there are pros and there are cons to this concept of toughness. You know, sport, it, we were just speaking before we came on the air here tonight, talking about how stoicism is almost baked into sport, right? Being able to so soldier through and be able to some, sometimes push aside our one kind of need in order to meet the performance demands of another, and especially in a team sport. But this idea of toughness also comes with it. A flip side where I think sometimes athletes, coaches, volunteers, parents have this association with the word toughness that if you're not mentally tough, it must mean, well, I guess I'm mentally weak and that that presumption is not helpful in order to get people to, to do more help seeking and be able to understand that it's, it's okay if this fluctuates, this concept of of mental toughness. So what would be another term? And so I really like using, it's not that I have completely dropped the term because it still exists. It's still very much part of the research. And there's a whole, you know, field surrounding mental toughness and equating it with resilience. But I like to use this idea of, of emotional agility is one way we can put it or having flexibility and knowing that whatever you're feeling right now and whatever is going on, will eventually pass and that there is hope that we have internal skills and things that we can do to help buffer ourselves when we have stress in our life. So mental flexibility, overusing the term um, mental toughness exclusively, and that just even the words can have a really big impact in a lot of areas in this field. We also have some tools that are included in the toolkit that Emma has um, made available for everyone and part of the Volleyball BC um, gang is, is this check-in tool and the traffic light method that was designed by Game Plan. It was borrowed from and adapted from the Mental Health Commission of Canada, and they've divided it into traffic light zones. So you've got the green zone and the amber zone and the red zone, just like you know the universal symbol for traffic. And getting athletes, coaches, parents, all stakeholders in sport a little more familiar with this concept and idea and, and really zoning in on where they are on any given day, because there might be a day when you're showing up at practice or you're getting ready for a board meeting or you're heading off to a tournament and you are really, you've got a lot going on and you can just sense that if you take a look at some of these Symp symptoms or states of being in the middle, you've got intermittent anxiety, maybe you're starting to have a little trouble sleeping because you've got increased stress right about now, your energy is a little on the low end of the scale, your performance has been suffering somewhat, you might become a little more socially withdrawn when you're in this challenge zone. It can be really good to understand where we are and find language for that and know that that's actually often a really typical part of the human experience, but especially in sport where we have a lot of challenges, of course we're gonna be in the challenge zone. And so what does that mean? Does it mean we throw our hands in the air and just sort of give up? Well, no, this is the perfect chance chance for us to exercise using some of the self-care that's necessary to perhaps edge us way back our our way back into the green zone where things are a little more stabilized we start to sleep a bit better um our mood might not be so edgy right and understanding which zone we're in can really help dictate how much self-care we might want to apply 
So this idea of the, the traffic light method, and there are other tools that are very similar, but go along sort of the mental health continuum is another tool that you will find in the toolkit. Other things to be aware of, if you're going to look at that concept of the, the zones, is to understand what this emotion wheel looks like as well. And athletes are going to find themselves I mean, it can be quite the kaleidoscope of where you are in this passionate world that we live in, in sport, you could find yourself going in the course of just simply one tournament, or frankly, even in an hour, you can find yourself migrating through all kinds. You can go from the red zone where you're feeling kind of anxious or pre-serve, or it's a really tight game to you're getting really excited and playful because now you're up a few points and the mood is lightened to rolling down into the blue zone where you make a big mistake. And especially when we're dealing with younger athletes or athletes that maybe have less experience, they can really be all over this emotion wheel. So just being able to understand that having fluctuating feelings and having feelings that are different in this weather report, this is a really easy way if you have children that are younger and have a tough time maybe dealing with more complex terms, you can introduce this concept of taking your emotional weather report. So you'll see you've got the red zone where it tends to be more really high energy, high arousal and negative feelings on the top left quadrant to energized and more positive in the top right, renewed and lower arousal or energy on the bottom right with things like calmness and trusting and peace. And then when we're edging towards more of the burnout state where we've got low arousal or energy and more negative feelings. So sometimes if we identify, for example, we're in our challenge zone and specifically I'm in my challenge zone and I am feeling stressed because I have a lot going on with school and I have this big playoff game coming up and I am just on edge, sometimes just naming it. And saying what it is, you know, that you're feeling, you might not even know why, but just naming it can kind of de-escalate them and normalize, not minimize, but normalize what you're feeling. And then we start looking at some self-care to maybe be able to manage that. So just giving language to athletes, giving language to coaches as well, because coaches are feeling this just alongside. And so are the parents, right? And so are the volunteers and the officials and the leaders and the volunteers. So just, I think, acknowledging our humanity. This is a really important model. I don't know why I'm highlighting the red zone, but <laughs> oh, I know why, because we use this for the performance anxiety. That's why I'm repurposing it from the performance anxiety uh, webinar that I did last year. So if you haven't seen it, go back in. And Emma, is it still available? We have that up, right? So it's recorded there. It's archived. Great. Yes. Well, all of these are actually recorded and like put all on our YouTube channel so I can send oh, the links to everybody. Okay, fantastic. So, so if we're going to talk about flexibility, we're going to talk about practicing better self-care. We need to think about, you know, what can we do to improve our mental health through self-care then? What can we do specifically in the sports sector? How does sport culture sometimes affect our mental health and where does, where does self-care fit in? And I wanted to make sure that we had the opportunity because we do have many tools in the toolkit that are very informative and some of them are provided. You'll see in the top left corner here, um, with the logo from the Canadian Mental Health Association. So we have permissions to be reusing and quoting from some excellent organizations that are available all across Canada. But this is a really great model that they use at the CMHA that shows that you can have, for example, in the bottom left quadrant, you can experience poor mental health but not necessarily having a mental health condition. So you've got um, on the two axes here, you've got symptoms of a mental health condition or, or, or not, no symptoms at all, right? And poor and very positive mental health. So you could actually have a mental health issue or concern and not necessarily have it obvious to everyone else, but you might be aware of some, some of these signs and symptoms, and you might need to enhance your own self-awareness and take a look at some of the tools and then decide whether or not you want to maybe get some help for that, or perhaps practice some of the self-care in order to manage some of the issues. 
that you might be having, but this tool and, and more explanation is also listed in some of the tools in the toolkit as well. Other tools, this is just another way, and it came out actually in the pandemic of having athletes really enhance their self-awareness, again, using the comfort challenge and stop zone or the red traffic light colors that are so recognizable during the pandemic. It was a really tough time for everyone, but in specifically at the Canadian Center for Mental Health and Sport, we wanted to design something that athletes could relate to. And we wanted to have something specifically so that they could identify where they were and be able to personalize plans to help them cope. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight, some of those self-care plans. And then finally, on this note of checking in, just as a final model, that's a little bit easier. If you're dealing with much younger athletes, so they may not even fully understand the zones, they're not as big into big text and they're, they prefer things like images and you might want to just talk about it as a team. You can have a discussion of what does it feel like to be in your challenge zone? What kind of emotions do you have? What's it feel like inside your stomach when you're feeling stressed, for example? What does the green zone feel like when it's smooth sailing and you're really relaxed and you're feeling like you're on top of the world and you could do anything? And it's important to talk about what is the red zone? So this is the zone where you likely are going to need to reach out and have some help or we can spot when an athlete is in that red zone and build some protectors in there so that we can find the language for it but also be able to take a break step back have a referral or someone who's designated on your team to help if someone does identify the fact that they're in that red zone so Again, more information, and we would welcome questions, or if anyone would like more information, we do have a lot of this included in the, and, and a little, it's a little bit more um, explanation laden in the way that we've packaged it in the toolkit. So tonight, we'll be discussing this idea of self-awareness and how you kind of check in. And I'm interested to hear from our ambassadors how they might actually check in, or did they check in when they were um, it, playing, for example, what are some self-regulation tools to really help with coping and that might make, make up part of that self-care, how to build in things like self-compassion, what are things that you can do for yourself to be able to, in a preventative sense, to be able to manage stress before it even escalates, and other things to explore like mindfulness, um, positive creative outlets, more kindness towards directed towards yourself, etc. So at this time, I'm going to stop talking and specifically because Shanice is running on all cylinders and maybe running out of battery herself. Um, I thought maybe we would start by asking her if there might have been times in your career when you were really managing a lot of stress and sort of how did you build in self awareness or understanding what those thresholds were and were there certain things that you would do when you knew that you were really, wow, like I'm pushed to my max. What were some things that you did in order to enhance your self-awareness or, or maybe, maybe that wasn't the case. Maybe you had to soldier on through them. I'm just wondering what it was like when you um, were playing. And I know you played in a variety of different environments, but what did that look like for you? Yeah. Um, I think for me, the most important thing has always been kind of what you've been bringing up, like naming it, um, trying to figure out what you're feeling, thinking, um, and the way that I was able to kind of sort through all my thoughts would be through writing, whether that was a more like formal journal process where I could, you know, ask myself a few questions and then write it out. Um, or whether I, you know, get sticky notes and, and write a thought of the day. I, I have always found there to be a lot of um, power and putting, you know, thoughts and pen to paper. Um, and so for me, that was really the, the one way that I found most useful to kind of check in with myself when I was at my most stress times or when I had a lot on my plate or when I you know, maybe my performance wasn't where I wanted it to be. If I could kind of write things all down and get it out of my head, then it didn't sit with me for forever. And I could kind of rebound the next day. I love that. 
those are really great concrete. So either journaling or even just doing like on a sticky note, like having that really in the moment thought, you can even put it somewhere, right? And be able to see it. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I, I still practice that now with the sticky notes. I'll like, I'll find a, a quote that maybe resonates with me with, you know, kind of whatever I'm going through and I'll put it on my fridge or I'll put it like above my bed. So that's been the one thing tried and true that's really worked for me. That's awesome. I have one here. It's on my computer. It said, <laughs> you got, it's, you got this <laughs> because I was starting some, a project and I was actually, I didn't got this. I was <laughs> I don't know if I could. And I just thought, you know what, I'm going to put it and I put it right beside my little touchpad on the computer. And it really does, isn't it? It's like your personal cheer cheerleading squad almost <laughs> when you got that. I love that. Thank you for sharing those. Those are great. How about you, Derek? Are you a journal guy? Are you a writing stuff down guy? Or what kind of things work for you? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely a big thinker. So I know my mind needs a place for my thoughts to go. Um, just so I think as, as Shanice was saying that I really resonate with that um, and so have found journaling to be a really effective thing even just find um, and this is something now you know when I was an athlete I probably wasn't very good at this I didn't really give myself space to do these things and that's kind of one of the things I recognized after finishing in volleyball was just recognizing the ways in which I sort of just kept everything very much contained inside and didn't really give it a space to just exist outside of my, you know, my, my squishy little brain. And, you know, it, it in there, it could cause me a lot of stress, a lot of added stress of this, these things that were going on inside for me. And so I think um, what I've learned now, and I know one of your questions will kind of come back to this of what I wish I knew back then, but spoiler alert um, is, it, yeah, it's just recognizing, yeah, there's, there's value in just giving my, myself space to just process space to kind of slow down space to sort of just be with what's going on in, inside of myself without judgment, without like criticism of what's there, just noticing it, being aware of it. Um, and, and I find for me when I'm not doing that is usually when I'm just distracted, when I'm going from one thing to the next thing to the next thing, which is, you know, very easy with this little thing right here. Uh, I don't give myself, you know, if I'm not giving myself much time just to like be in some sense, which sounds so silly, so simple in a sense of just like, but, you know, in our, in our world of full of distractions, it's very hard to actually do that in some sense. And so I think I'm recognizing that, and this is honestly more and more later or more and more recently, I'm realizing how much it's important just to, I don't know, go for a walk, just to take time to just process things, just to think things through, or even to talk with someone. Um, you know, I think that's a big thing I really struggle with as an athlete is I just again, kept everything inside and thought I could figure it out on my own and didn't really tell people I was struggling and continued to struggle because uh, I thought I had to figure it out on my own. And, you know, some of that is I realized I can, I can process a bit, but I also realized I could have used some help too. So I think that, you know, even though that's care externally, I think there's a self-care in recognizing that you, it's okay to ask for help. Absolutely. I mean, that's where it all starts, right? Is with self-awareness. We can't get to that next stage of help seeking if we haven't sort of figured that out of where we're at, or it's also, I guess this is kind of adjacent to that it might not even be about us. It could be that we're noticing that our teammate is in the challenge zone, right? And it's like our teammate isn't practicing some of that self-care if we really, and we do get to know our teammates really well, right? If we do sport right, we get to know people and we build actual caring relationships and we can spot when sometimes they're not being super self-aware, but we can see it. And so there's also that just caring and reaching out piece um, if there is that athlete or coach or whatever role you have in sport that is keeping it inside and just asking, we've got a whole section on a communication section about listening with empathy and how you can communicate and be able to destigmatize those conversations around mental health. So that's a really great segue, Derek, into that. Um, and thank you. Thanks to both of you for those really great ideas. And like just your lived experience is so rich. This actually and blends well into some of these core strategies for managing stress and anxiety. If we look at some of the broader categories that through the research and more applied practice in really popular uh, mental health agencies across Canada and internationally, 
you've got them broken down into four main ones on this particular slider model. So there's a tension or centering technique. So that could be just exploring concepts like meditation is really having a moment because yoga is getting more and more popular. I think everywhere you go, there's a yoga studio popping up, especially if you live in the lower mainland, they're everywhere. And, um, and understanding breath work and the power of breath and oxygenated blood and an oxygenated brain and how important it is and using things like visualization of course for performance but also for well-being and just sort of seeing yourself in a really calm amazing place so having sort of attention and centering techniques that can help neutralize anxiety and be able to expand creative thinking for example so that's one way that we can practice self-care and manage anxiety at the same time the other one is where we're specifically looking at our power of expression comes into things like journaling actually fits into this category as well as the reflection category. I think journaling, I've had some athletes where they're even doing doodles as well. So they're not just writing words. They're also drawing pictures and especially for the younger ones that are really creative and artistic and don't always have the words, they can just draw the pictures or draw the face, the expression of how they're feeling in their performance journals. That can be a really great way to get it out as well. Working on some kind of project, some kind of artistic endeavor. So that can be a really powerful self-care mechanism. And I just think it's a really important part of being a human is to exercise our creative side that we don't always get to exercise in sport. The third one, reflection and exploring strategies. So this is where um, specifically the journaling fits in here or things like self-monitoring. If you're a checklist kind of person, I love checklists. It makes me feel like I'm really accomplishing things. I like it. <laughs> you know, yeah. Check, check. Of course it has a downside because if you have 25 things on it and then you only do eight of them, again, we have to be realistic and kind to ourselves when we don't get down all 25, but self-monitoring too, in the sense of monitoring emotions, monitoring tasks, however you want to divide that. And then of course, just understanding how to communicate with others. Derek's great point of sharing, right? Sharing with others and learning how to have positive communication strategies. Sharing this feeling in the moment, sometimes just bouncing it off another person and bringing it out of your head to a trusted colleague or friend or teammate can do wonders. Just the sharing of a feeling or a thought or a state. If there's someone you've built a trusting relationship with, that can be so therapeutic and really great self-care as well. And then the last one, of course, nutrition. We're exercising because in sport, but um, any other kind of, I guess, uh, Derek mentioned just going for a walk. Exercise doesn't have to be grueling and the kind that's necessarily um, really high, high impact, high tempo can be outside and even combining techniques. So taking the deep breaths, being really mindful of your surroundings and going for a walk and get, and we really should have getting out in nature on one of these slides. I guess I would put it in the healthy lifestyle and the balanced lifestyle, being in contact with nature. Some cultures call it nature bathing um, is more of an Asian term. And I, I love it. Bathing in nature is a really great way to reset the nervous system and make us feel more connected to our planet and nature around us. So these are some strategies, experiment a bit with those. Maybe some resonate with you more than others. Try with one and then go to another quadrant and see if that suits your personality and experiment a bit. This is another sheet, um, that we sometimes will use with athletes if they're getting to a point where in the season where we want to do something creative and we want to either brainstorm as a team or maybe just have people do this individually, think about the different things that they can control and that are in that self-care realm and then the things that they need to let go and just adapt to and just accept that they're going to happen and just let it go. So you'll see it. I don't know, it's kind of small font, so you might have to squint, but it says things like, you know, fuel and hydration. A lot of things, frankly, like the previous slide, positive communication, spiritual practices, meditation, getting school support if you need that extra support, connecting with other people, general self-care. So that could be even something like um, 
filing your nails, you know, whatever you feel is part of your repertoire that you can control and tends to make you feel like you're keeping on top of caring for yourself, which is exactly what the term means. So focusing on those and then naming a few things that are going around up here, but over which you have almost no control, but are maybe taking up a little bit too much space. So that could be ruminating over the mistakes you made in the last game or something that is upsetting or is causing stress to you, but you have absolutely no ability to change it or an outcome or some kind of constraint. Is there something next to it that can help buffer it that you do have some control and autonomy over? And even that, just that brainstorm is a good exercise to do. And that's anyone. This isn't just exclusively for athletes. I think coaches need to do this too. Coaches have a ton on their plate. So do parents. So do sport leaders. So are the volunteers that make sport happen. So being able to let go of the things I cannot control. There's that one issue that just keeps coming up again and again. And I need to learn to let it go. And I'm going to focus over here because it fills my cup. That's self-care. Another thing that we can do is we can frame it in the way of goal setting. So it's similar idea to the last slide is where we might want to put our focus. And this can be a fun thing if a team is getting ready for playoffs, for example, and you get them all together and you could do this individually or you could do this as a team. But again, you're looking at things in control and out of control. What are some of the things if you're going into playoffs and provincials and league finals Things like your training conditions, you can't always control which gym you're going to be in. You can't always control schedules or delays, transportation complications, other people's behavior, right? Um, you might have differing opinions on some of the calls and we want to be respectful to our officials, right? So letting some of that stuff go and instead redirecting or pulling from the team. So have the coaches, have the engaged parents, have the athletes come up with the areas that are in their control, especially in the performance realm, but also in the self-care realm, like nutrition, hydration, rest, recovery, positive connection with others. All these things are going to fill your cup. You're going to have a better experience. If you're in that challenge zone, you're going to be a heck of a lot closer to the end that's near the green zone than the red zone, right? If we're focusing in on this autonomy supportive area of things in our control. Another model that I really love that's based on the medicine wheel with our indigenous sport community is one that I, I use when I'm working with the indigenous sport and recreation um, council of British Columbia, which is this holistic model that they use and they use it in their national models as well that where they've been working with the Aboriginal sports circle where they've divided it into thinking about your physical self and what you need to feel physically cared for. So all the things we'd associate with there, so rest and recovery and fuel and all the things that we would deem in the physical realm, the mental and emotional things, what are some things that fill our cup there? And will be and a lot of things we've already been mentioning in today's webinar, but the two that often people forget are things like cultural and spiritual. And these two pieces we know from a lot of the research and as we're trying to open up and have and embracing diversity and embracing inclusion in sport, this is a really great way as well where teams can bond and share different rituals and cultural aspects. If you have a very multicultural team and you have a way to share some of the things that are special to your family or to where you come from or where your parents and grandparents have, have shared certain um, cultural aspects. This is a really great way to expand your concept of self-care and realize that that's one of the beautiful things about being Canadian and being in a multicultural society. So this model is, um, I don't know if we have a toolkit item for this, Emma, but if we don't, we can create one, you know? Yeah. I, I don't we, think we have this specific one, but I like it. Yeah, it's great. And there are some great, it, just a shout out quickly to take the um, Indigenous, it, it's technically, it's they call it the participant model versus the athlete model, the long-term, um, the Indigenous long-term participant model. 
I actually just took it last week in Langley. It was fantastic. And so I'd recommend that if you ever get the chance to take that training to investigate that. It's an amazing experience and a fantastic two-day course. So stress threshold awareness ties in a little bit to the concept we were discussing earlier about self-awareness and where you might be on that continuum. So recognizing what your, I guess, you know, the, the big word for it, as the little kids call it, is threshold. Um, but a more understandable would be kind of level. What's the level of stress that you're managing it right now? Can you cut down on some of those threats that are within your control when you're at that limit? So is it time to say no to something, right? You're just taking on, Janice actually brought this up before we logged in here tonight, that it can be really tough, especially those coaches who just think they can just roll with it and just do everything, right? Our coaches are amazing. They're balancing a ton. Sport parents, athletes too. I think we all could do a healthy dose of saying no sometimes or being able to recognize when we're maxed out and when it might mean time to delegate to someone else or to maybe shift gears or simply take a break. I can't do it right now. I can eventually, but at the moment, I need a quick break. Acknowledging that is okay. It's great for our mental and physical health when we build boundaries. Mindfulness, again, paying attention to the present moment. Derek talked about this, not judging himself for having complicated feelings, not judging himself for when he was feeling overloaded sometimes as an athlete or otherwise. You know, why am I feeling this way? Does this mean that I'm not, you know, stoic enough? Does it mean, no, it means we're human, it means we're human. And I'm not going to judge this moment. Maybe it means I need to take a little more recovery time. Maybe it means I need to get through this next drill for the next few minutes and get some hydration or share my thoughts with my coach or who knows, but being aware of it and accepting sometimes when we're at that threshold and not judging ourselves for it, catching ourselves when the thoughts become increasingly negative and different to and difficult to manage. And this is a big one. I know that coaches are trying to become more aware of their own thoughts, their own negative self-talk too, and then how that might project onto their athletes. And in a previous webinar, I believe it was the one, I might've mentioned it also on the positive body image webinar, but I know I, know I discussed it in the managing performance anxiety is introducing a mindfulness complex uh, concept at the very base called developing a wise mind approach. And this is making anyone who's understanding this model more aware of the, the states of mind. So when they are in a very highly emotional state and that emotion mind is driving their behavior, naming it to tame it, saying, Ooh, I'm feeling it's very emotional right now. I'm feeling, and maybe even name it. If you know what that emotion is, sometimes you don't, you're just, you're just tense. You're not sure what it is, but you can name it. Sometimes you're in full on just, I am in problem solving mode. I am in logical mode. I am in reasonable mind. I'm not necessarily engaging as heavily into my emotional mind. We might be over there too, especially when we're doing schoolwork or doing some um, really task focused. The wise mind and where I think performers tend to be at their best is when we're balancing both. So part of self-care is exercising and flexing and becoming more aware of what mind state of mind we're in and learning to shuttle in between. And there's lots of ways to do that. And some of the tools talk about that, about mindfulness breathing, being able to shuttle and shift focus, one breath relaxation. That's one of the worksheets. Um, but this this model, there, there are tons of ex explanations online as well if you want to find out more about this, but it can be a great self-care mechanism as well. This was, we did really last minute change to this slide, <laughs> two seconds before we logged on. Um, this is one model, there, there are tons, but it's an example of a group that I was working with where we were coming up with the basics of what the building blocks for their self-care were gonna be. And so we did a group brainstorm 
And it was, we needed to be aware of the amount of sleep that we were getting. We felt that was really important. So just a little more aware of that. See if we can tack one more hour on better go to bed rituals, um, where we, what we do with our devices, et cetera. So sleep is a whole workshop all its own, but it's very critical to human functioning and certainly to recovery. And it's where everything rege regenerates and rejuvenates. So it's so critical to over overall health and wellness nutrition. Of course, I shouldn't obviously, and that's, that's a whole thing it's on its own well as well right is having the dietetics piece and understanding the importance of fuel of course exercise we're in a sector where exercise is put at the forefront but ex exploring a little bit with exercise that it doesn't again always have to be intense it can be gentle it can be stretching it could be flexibility work it could be pure movement for the joy of movement and that it's not just to do with, oh, this will make me a better volleyball player. This will make me a better athlete and make me feel honestly just more, just better well being by moving and getting out in nature. Others, connection. They felt this particular group feeling connected and not isolated was a big part of their self care. When they start to feel lonely, they start to feel alone. That's where think mood starts dipping. So connection they felt was actually, actually played a huge, huge role in their self-care. So getting enough sleep, managing their fuel, regular exercise and connecting, feeling truly connected. Mindfulness. One example is being more aware and developing that wise mind, understanding more about meditation and maybe researching how you can integrate meditation into your day or, or practice like yoga or just a, going on a mindful walk and just noticing and describing things around you is a mindful exercise. This was what we added right when we came on. I'm going to give this to Shanice because this was her idea. And maybe, you know what, why don't you talk about it a bit, Shanice? What were we talking about when we, I don't even remember what we were doing to prompt it, but we're just talking about the saying no in a good way. What was it? Do you want to take that one? I don't remember exactly what we were talking about either, but just this, I think for a lot of coaches and maybe this is a little bit more applicable to the adults, but the, the need to take on a lot of things and this sense of, at least this is how my brain works. I feel like I'm very high functioning that I have this, like, I can do anything mentality. Yeah. If my boss at work asks me to do five things, yes, let me take them all on to the point where it overwhelms me and I get a little bit too stressed or anxious. Um, and so trying to figure out where is that, where is that boundary? Where can I step in and say no and be like, no, that's actually too much as a form of self-care instead of viewing it as maybe like a weakness. Exactly. Yeah. That I think we were just talking about some of the challenges of coaching. Yeah. And specifically that's what launched us into that, but you're right. Like anyone in any role, I guess, could fall into the not having the solid boundaries. there, not having a lot of trouble saying no and uh, delegating, for example. So yeah, thank you for that ex explanation. And then on the bottom, they kind of, I don't know why I have them all in the same cell, but this idea of being compassionate to yourself, being gentle with yourself and kind with yourself and aware of the way that you talk to yourself inside your own head. If we could stick the microphone in there, what is the kind of language and tone that you're using with yourself? Is it gentle? Is it forgiving? Is it matter of fact, but fair, right? So not everyone is going to have super gentle, flowery self-talk language. And, and that's okay if that isn't your nature. But I think we all need to work towards budging ourselves over into more of the self-compassion and kindness realm, especially in sport, which does tend to be, I've used the word stoic many times tonight, but it does tend to be a more of a, we need to be stoic, we need to be able to manage things like pain and discomfort and difficult emotions. And it is competitive. That's why they call it competitive sport sometimes. So there's a lot of discomfort we have to weather with sport, but that's all the more reason why we also have to be gentle with ourselves when we need to prepare 
and recover from it. So I think it's important that we move in this direction. And more and more when I'm working in high performance sport, this is a model that I use with our national team and Olympic and Paralympic athletes a lot because they have a very strong self-critic. It's why they've gotten so far in sport because they were able to push themselves. But in order to sustain that and reach the highest heights, I think we also have to be gentle with ourselves when we really need it or we will burn out, right? So it's building a balance in the language. I think sports come a long way. We're not quite there, but we're getting there about being a little more gentle to ourselves and others and that performance can still exist in a self-compassionate sport universe. The two can exist, right? Um, Derek, would you add anything to this model? I mean, you work in the field of mental health. Would you add, are we missing something that you would have put in here for your own? I'm getting putting you on the spot. I didn't warn you. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, I'd say this is really complete in many ways. I mean, I would only want to reiterate the self-compassion piece um, further. I think that's such a, it's something I've been thinking more about just in terms of how do we um, integrate that into sport that in a way that sort of suits the culture in a sense, like in, and like you said, in that mindset of really wanting to push ourselves, yeah. like what does it mean to push ourselves in a way that's not, mm, not as much critical, but more encouraging in a way. And, um, someone I really like in the field of self-compassion is Kristen Neff. I'm not sure if you're familiar with her. She's a big researcher in that, but she talks about this sort of the yin and the yang of self-compassion where there's this tender self-compassion, which is kind of the one we're all familiar with, which is very kind and and saw, and that gentleness. But then there's also this, this fierce self-compassion that she refers to, which is a bit more of that, like uh, she uses the analogy of like a mother bear and its cub. That that mother bear would be very protect, very kind and caring and nurturing, but it would also be willing to protect and provide and motivate that cub. And, and I, don't know, I just think it's, it sort of offers this other side to what is it, what does it look like to, to push ourselves in a way that's, that's encouraging and supportive and sort of sees like, hey, I think you're really capable of, of doing some great things here. What would it look like to kind of get you to that, that next step? Um, uh, and then also having that side that says like, oh, that was a really tough loss. Let's just sort of sit in the, in the, the, the pain of that. And like, it's okay to, to be upset. It's okay to be sad about that. And it doesn't mean that we can't we have to lose compassion. It's just that it's sort of what do we need in the moment? And I think that to me is like a big piece. And I, you know, I say that I know your question coming up, like that's something I wish I knew more about when I was when I was younger was how to um, to be this mental toughness yet kind to myself. I think that's such a um, important thing that I, I just didn't really know how to do. I didn't have a voice for it in myself. I didn't know how to do that for myself, and so. It's something I've cultivated more recently in my life, and I found it's been a huge thing, and it hasn't led to a drop in my performance. I think that's like the important piece. Exactly. That's, the, that's I think, the biggest uh, misconception is that somehow by being more gentle, compassionate, but also fierce in a, in a good way, right, supportively fierce or fiercely supportive, <laughs> I guess, um, can actually lead to an increase in performance, right, and longevity, and anti-burnout, all those things. And I use a ton of Kristen stuff. It's probably my biggest go-to and one of the exercises in the performance anxiety workshop that was recorded last year was a sort of a hand over heart exercise where this could be pre going into something stressful or if something stressful has happened, a way that you can just be compassionate afterwards. You just name sort of how you're feeling and just say like, whoa, that was tough. Like what you just said, Derek, like, wow, that was a tough loss. Right. And then adding something physical, like just putting your hand over your heart, feeling the heartbeat and honoring your common humanity. Probably everyone on your team felt it too. Every athlete has felt this. Every coach has felt this, the feeling of loss. And, and now making that statement of whether it's fiercely supportive to yourself or fiercely, I'm going to recover as best I can. May I be kind. May I be strong. May I be patient with myself. You fill in the blank of what you need in that moment. And that's sort of the beauty of it is that it's super flexible and it's very proactive and can lead to better recovery. So it isn't about being 
soft. I don't even like that we're label it that way, that it's a soft skill. It's not, it's very hard to do, right? Mm. But it's what's going to build longevity, I think, in our sector over time. <laughs> I, I, don't, I just want to jump in and wonder if this is a good place where we had a number of questions come forward about how parents or coaches could support athletes in those moments. And so I'm just wondering, like we've already, you just talked an actual specific technique, Shauna and Derek, but like, is there other things that, you know, where it is that kind of more, um, it's, it's less the kind of chronic self-care and it's more the acute self-care when you're in that really tough moment, especially coming into provincials and things either go well or they don't go well for you. And mm -hmm. I a number of questions that we got were from parents, for example, going, how do I support my kid in a self-caring way or to show understanding or how do I support them in that moment? So is there anything that else that you want to add to, on top of what you've already sort of said on that topic that of things or roles that people can play, I guess, for parents and or coaches? Well, I think I'm going to let also Shanice and Derek answer this one too, because I'm sure they have some great ideas. I know for me, when I'm working with coaches and they can spot, you know, sometimes just with the body language, even you don't even need to hear what your athletes are saying. You can see when they are stressed when they are sad, when they're upset, when they're angry. And so modeling that and maybe even saying, so you've got your huddle afterwards or you've got your team meeting and modeling the kind of self-talk and compassion that you're hoping that they'll be able to transfer in themselves. That's one way. So modeling effect, don't underestimate how important that is. Same for parents. So I guess I'm also doing a call out to the adults, right? That are, that are, guiding the youth in the sport of volleyball is that we also have to pay attention to what we're doing too. So it's twofold awesome thing. You're going to improve your own self-regulation and self-care by trying to be a good model. And you're going to hopefully have this residual effect on the athlete that's watching you and learning from you and how you do it. So learn some of these techniques yourself. Coaches, don't be afraid to use some of these worksheets and be able to run through a few of these things going into major games or have it as part of your group stretch. You're also doing some of this discussion. I call it stacking tools where you're not just doing one thing, you're having a drill, but you're also using a mental health component or a mental performance component while you're doing something physical like stretching. So that's one way that you can integrate it. Um, Derek and Shanice, do you have something that was would you give us a tip to really encourage athletes to be a little bit easier on themselves or be able to buffer some of the effects of, of the strain of playoffs? Um, I just have one comment, I guess. And I think this is tailored a little bit more to the parents. Um, I'm trying to think of like moments where I suffered maybe like a really bad loss or maybe I didn't get any play time throughout a whole weekend and it was devastating to me. I think what worked for me and how my mom approached our relationship, um, she wasn't afraid to kind of like sit in my emotions and my feelings with me. Um, rather than trying to solve my problems for me. She allowed me a space where I could, you know, if I wanted to cry or if I wanted to swear about it, swear and just kind of like get everything off my chest. And she like would be able to acknowledge my pain, but not try to offer me any solution or like you should have done this better. And maybe you would have like won that game. Trying to allow your kids to... A, be there with them, but also allow them to kind of experience what they're experiencing and navigate it through their own. And I, I found that super beneficial to kind of work my way through it, but also know that like my parent was there in it with me, essentially. I love that. Yeah, there's some, um, there's a video out there by, I think it's I think it might be the true sport project and it's called the, the van ride home or the ride home. Have any of you seen that? Emma, have you seen that one? Yeah. yeah. Like it's called the car ride home. Car and ride it's basically, home. yeah, the kid gets in the back seat and they can just hear their parent going on about everything they should have done during the game. 
Yeah. So, so kind of, you know, not to say I'm sure that parent was well-meaning, but sort of the polar opposite of what you're saying, Shani. So you're, you're in the same vehicle, but you're giving the athlete the space to feel the way that they're feeling and work through that and share it with you, but you're not trying to dictate how they're supposed to feel, right? Just letting them build those skills. Cause we can't, yeah, that's the thing is, you know, some of it is taken on by modeling and osmosis if we're a really positive model, but there's a, a huge component to just letting them explore and learn and, and be there with them in the discomfort of that in the car, right? And versus, yeah, that video is more of a what not to do video. So I don't even know if I want to recommend you see it, but it's um, it's a powerful message though. And, and I understand the reasoning behind making the video. Um, but I think so many parents are amazing and, and wouldn't offer that type of approach. I love that, Shanice. Um, what do you think, Derek? There's something else you'd want to add? Um, yeah, I would actually just want to piggyback off that because there's to make it even a little more practical too. Um, I think about this a lot in like any sort of relationship, whether it's in, you know, in a, a marriage or with a child to, or parent the child, um, is in those moments when we're not like sure what to say or what to do, we just ask. And one of the, like the simplest questions we can ask, I find comes down to, do you, do you want solutions or comfort? And I find that question can save a whole lot of headache because sometimes we think this person wants a solution. I'd say that's where we often go. I think as a parent or as like a caring spouse or partner, we're very quick to be like, how do I fix this? And we want to offer solutions. And what that person wanted when they were coming to you was just comfort, a shoulder to cry on, someone to talk to. And, and you just, you, you kind of like two ships passing in the night where you both move in the directions towards one another, but you miss each other. And so, um, and what I find that can do is if it is that there's that need for comfort, it gives you that place to start. And then often what happens on the other side of that comfort is then the solutions can come. And I think, especially in the context of like sports where parents maybe have some insights of like, they saw this, but if that's like the first thing you come at a kid with, they're going to just shut down because they're just feeling sad and, and beat up and like, um, really hurt by the loss. And they just need someone who can just kind of be like, like Shanice's mom was able to do, just be in her corner. And, you know, on the other side, of that, there might be that opportunity to be like, hey, and do you want to talk about how the game went and some things that you could work on and some stuff that I saw that, you know, and maybe they don't want that. And you have as a parent have to kind of just, you know, and a coach sometimes maybe even just have to be like, okay, this isn't the time. Um, and I think what that, the double side of that was that can do is then it gives the kid the autonomy to say, well, what what do I actually need? It puts the ball in their court to be like, oh, wait, how do I what do I actually need in this moment? Um, so I find it's twofold in that regard. And I love yeah. that. So you said, so comfort, do you want comfort? Do you want a solution? And even maybe you could add like, um, do you even want to talk about it right now? Yeah, because maybe absolutely. They don't, right. Maybe yeah, they, space. They yeah, you want space. Yeah. You just want space. I love that. Yeah. We should put that, that you want to talk about sticky notes. Maybe that's what we need to have <laughs> a car ride home. Boom. Like right on the, right on the dashboard. Yeah not a bad idea. And on the coach's clipboard, I mean, we're all just, we're all just bumbling through trying to do the best we can, right? It, parenting is tough. Coaching is tough. Relationships are tough. And so the, the whole concept behind these um, webinars and us working on this all together as a community is getting these great, rich ideas from a bunch of different creative minds. And so there you go. Two really great approaches. Shanice's mom just holds space um, holding space kind of approach. And then Derek's really great, like doing it almost like a triage, you know, like, which is it, which way do we want to go and put, put the athlete, for example, in the driver's seat. So awesome that Emma, there you go. So we got some really good practical application, right? There we go. Check. Okay, good. Let's make her Shauna's happy now. Okay. We checked the list, those off the list. Um, and then speaking of lists, so this is because some athletes like, you know, they like plans, right? Some don't, some do. Some like to feel like they are prepared and they know that if they've got this prepared, then they don't have to think when they're in a moment of crisis or feeling burnt out or feeling, you know, they're already kind of in that challenge zone. They kind of have already thought through some of their go-to strategies. So this one, for example, is a daily self-care plan. It's a modified version from the Canadian Center for Mental Health and Sport, and you can get it as well as part of a template if you take the Mental Health and Sport 
course through the Coaching Association of Canada on coach.ca. You go in the back in the locker, you get yourself a national certification program number. You don't have to be a coach, actually. You can be a volunteer. You can be a parent. You can even be an athlete. If you're over the age of, I think it's 15 or 16, you can take it on your own. It's less than an hour and you'll get things like this template. So you've got mind, body, emotion, social, spirit, school, um, some of the kind of go-to practices in each category. So just a variation on the theme of some of the other templates we were looking at. You've got your top three positive coaching or coping strategies, right? And self-care strategies to help you manage when you're having a tough time. And then in a, if there is a crisis though, and you're really struggling, what is helpful and what's harmful? So know your patterns. These are some of the things I tend to do and I don't want to do this. I don't want to chew my nails right off down to the nail bed, but I know that's something that I tend to do and I'm trying to stop doing that. So being more aware of it and putting it on here and coming up with something different, right? Having some strategies that are more helpful and maybe there's a go-to person there's someone or persons, plural, that is really kind of your buddy system. A lot of teams will set up sort of a veteran and a newcomer to the team. That might be their go-to person. Or you're building relationships on teams where you have somebody on the team that you connect with um, that might be that person for you. But what about this idea, you know, you did spoiler alert earlier, Derek, and even thinking about this idea, what would be some of these, if you, you were to do your plan back in the day, what do you wish that younger version of yourself had emphasized more? You've already mentioned the self-compassionate voice, a little more awareness of that would have been one thing. What else were you thinking? Um, I think for me, and this is definitely just like not everybody, but I know for me, like I'm a very relational person. Like I just, I, I care a lot about my relationships. And I think for me, I took a lot of time to care about the people around me. Um, I was sort of a counselor on my team in some sense, and now I find myself a counselor today. Um, and I think part of that led to me neglecting myself, right? My, my, my well-being, my needs. And, you know, I think this ties a lot into self-compassion. And I, I talk about this when I work with people in my job, like uh, we're very good at being compassionate to others, but we suck at doing it for ourselves. <laughs> and, and, you know, I think it, it's, it comes from a good place. It, it comes from a, a sense of wanting to care for others. But, you know, I think we're so good at spotting when other people are being hard on themselves, but, you know, struggling to kind of do that for ourselves. And so, I think if I could have had more of that ability to to engage with that, again, have that compassionate voice, that that recognition of like, would I treat a friend the way I'm treating myself? Would I what would I say to a friend if I was going through, if they were going through what I was going through? Like that in itself can be such a simple answer into uh, a different way of approaching it. Because if they deserve it, then why not you? Like it sort of just comes down to that for me. And so I think that would have been huge uh, if I could have had more of that in a way in my life. I love that. I feel you heavily on that. Yes. <laughs> That's, I love that one. Thank you for that. Do you have something too, Shanice, that you wish younger version of Shanice? Yeah, definitely. If I have like one regret about my playing career, it would be the fact that I didn't become like a well-rounded person until much later in life. And so I had a, like a, I had a traumatic injury when I was 25 years old and that I needed shoulder surgery. This was my big, my first major injury in sport. And like the moment my sport was taken away from me, my identity essentially crumbled. I was like, oh, who the heck is Shanice? <laughs> and so if there's one thing in like talking about a self click self-care plan I really wish I would have explored other things that I like more at an earlier age it took me to much later in life to get to do that where now I love I love painting I enjoy drawing I enjoy reading and those were you know a lot of things that I didn't explore when I was younger because I was so heavily invested and so heavily focused on my sport which you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It helps get me from A to B and, and have a really great career. But 
that's just one thing I, I wish I would have spent more time on in my youth so that I, you know, didn't struggle so much when my sport was taken away from me. And I, I, I'm going to have to go after this, but I, I, there's like one quote that I, I live by now. And it's, it's basically that you've made it through a hundred percent of all of your bad days. And it's easy for me to say that now being on the other side of some very difficult things that I've had to experience in sport. Um, but I think if I could have, you know, been a little bit more well-rounded growing up or at least e explored different things, it wouldn't have been so challenging to go through some of those things. That's awesome. Thank you so much. That's a great one to end on. And now speaking of self-care, yeah, maybe you need to head off to <laughs> in a different time zone. Yes. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks. And that great idea. Yeah. Just that really balanced identity is so key. Um, and I, and I think it is tough because we expect a lot of, there's a lot of commitment involved in developing your sport excellence and, you know, technical and tactical abilities and all, all that is part of being a well-rounded, rounded athlete. But when we say well-rounded, you know, that also means things that are non-athletic things that have to do with other aspects to your identity. So that balance can be really important to introduce that earlier on this. I wanted to also just, um, to make sure tonight I showed maybe a few more examples of some of what you'll get if you do decide to take the mental health and sport workshop um, or course that you can take through the Coaching Association of Canada. This is one section that they have on developing a self-care plan and sort of how you typically tend to deal with life's demands. And they actually have geared this because it's made by the Coaching Association of Canada, they specifically were looking at this particular course with the lens of a coach. So the coach and how the coach would apply this to themselves, but also the awareness to be able to apply this to their athletes. But it doesn't mean that you couldn't be a sport parent taking this or an official or frankly, any other role in sport, you would benefit from taking the same thing. So you see here some helpful co um, coping strategies, some harmful coping strategies. So a bit of a self-awareness tool, but also being able to build your inventory and understanding a little more towards what, what have been my go-tos traditionally. And maybe do I need to retire some of these? They're just not serving me, right? I tend to go towards this and I, I end up feeling more stressed or more anxious when I'm scrolling through social media to re to relax, it is in fact not relaxing me. And this is something that more and more actually a lot of youth that I work with in my private practice are saying they used to use social media, they thought it relaxed them, but it actually got them more stressed. And it, in, in it enhanced their fear of missing out and all kinds of really stress provoking mental states. So this is one of the sheets. Other helping uh, coping strategies as well and leaving space for you to come up with your own. So of course they provide some that are already there for you to see some more common ones, but then they leave it up to you to be able to fill in the blanks and, and create your own in the plan. Other things, not unlike the template that we were looking at a few minutes ago, daily self-care, different dimensions to that self-care. So looking at it from a psychological point of view, Connecting with your values. So what's the most important thing to you that you might value, okay, in this psychological realm? And so it gives some examples here, like disconnect from electronic devices, make a budget, keep a calendar, make a to-do list, seek support from a counselor, make my bed every morning, do a gratitude list. This is going to be very unique to everyone, but it gives you lots of different ideas and Hopefully it'll take your time as you fill this out. If you decide this is a useful exercise, coaches, parents, whatever role you are watching this webinar can be a very powerful tool. And I use it with athletes um, as well. So what's important to me? I value what? So link it to your values. What's important? What do you currently do? And what are some of the practices maybe through the, the taking of the course that you might want to try to add to your self-care plan? Then you look at the physical realm, then you look at the emotional realm, and then you look at the social, spiritual, and cultural. So you'll see this links together and meshes really well with the holistic model from iSpark or the Indigenous sport community. 
So doing and repeating the same exercise and ideas and internal brainstorm and putting it on, putting it down on paper and going through the exercise is one thing, applying it is another, right? So really trying to see if we can follow this and enhance our self-care by taking action. And they do have a whole section on an emergency self-care aspect to your plan. We do have many tools as well in our toolkit on ways that we can make decisions, whether we are personally experiencing a mental health emergency or a non-emergency. So some of those tools are in our toolkit, how to apply them, how to talk about it and approach a mental health emergency or non-emergency. And this is how to incorporate it into the plan. So signs that potentially there is a mental health disturbance that has happened in the past, um, for example, and some signs that it's coming. You, you already know when you kind of hit that limit and you're going from challenge zone into red zone, I know when I haven't been practicing good self-care, this is what starts happening. I start getting snippy with people. My, I get, you know, maybe someone has migraines and migraines start to cascade through on a more frequent basis. Maybe there's some gastrointestinal stuff goes on. Everybody, it will manifest differently for everyone. So this is, again, a check-in to be more self-aware with what are your personal signs that the, the, the water's getting choppy, right? What does that look like for you in your life experience? And what are some ways that you can enhance relaxation, enhance a sense of calmness that can help you manage a feeling of being irritated or frustrated? What's helpful? What's harmful, right? So naming both, not just what's helpful, name what's harmful, because the more that we can make it overt and pull it out of the shadows and challenge ourselves to see if we can replace it or experiment with alternatives, the more apt we are to actually make it make a change. So it's all part of behavior change um, theory. And then gives other suggestions like self-talk, which we discussed earlier, social support, managing mood or emotions and being aware of mood and emotions. And, oh, I thought I had one more. Okay. So that's what that looks like. And I believe, so when I took it, I, I piloted it. And then, and then the final version, it was less than an hour. It was less than an hour, but it was time well spent. And I've had talked to many coaches and many athletes who some of them ended up transitioning into coaching, all felt it was very useful, especially the templates and some of the tools that you get upon completing the course too. So all of that and many other forms of training for mental health and sport are listed as well in one of our pillars. And I can't remember which it is, Emma, but it's in there. There's a whole, there's a toolkit with a bunch of different trainings, courses, workshops, many of which are free or very low cost. And, um, if that's an area that you're interested in for your own development, I would recommend taking a look at that tool and see if there's something in there that looks of interest to you. And just as a reminder to explore a little further this the concept of mindfulness and self-compassion. We brought this up several times tonight. Derek in particular really highlighted that this is a very powerful in his practice, but also looking back at his career and thinking about how changing that voice and being aware of that voice and, and the concept of self-compassion and kindness and, and fierce support is going to enhance, I think, mental health and wellness as well as performance. So let's see if we can work on this myth that has been around since forever, that if we are aware and self-compassionate, it means that we are somehow going to have a decline in performance. I would argue most of the research that's been conducted, the action research happening right now and has taken place over the last 10, 15 years in high-performance sport would, would prove the absolute opposite. And it also extends careers it avoids volunteer burnout. It will keep your coaches engaged, right? And it's even, it's great for relationships, all of it. So I don't know, it's not a panacea. It's not going to solve everything, but I think it's a very powerful um, enhancement to things you may already be doing to cope and, and to practice your own self-care. So 
but it's just you, Derek. So it's, it's good. I just have it singular ambassador input as in there's one <laughs> you're it. Um, but where there's some, I don't know, this is a bit of a catch all this particular question, but is there anything else that we haven't covered tonight or thinking about ones maybe that you learned through sport and they've really stuck with you today now that you're, you know, you're managing a family and you're a dad now and all these things, something that really are still really true today. However you want to answer this is up to you. Yeah. Floor is mine, I suppose. Yes, um, go for it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know, I think we've definitely covered a lot of things and a lot of things I, I fundamentally really try to hold myself to um, and have found to be helpful. But I think I mentioned this a couple presentations ago, and I think it's something I would want to reiterate, which is just around like um, creating room for like play, I think, in my life. Again, sports are so competitive and I forget that idea like it's ultimately a game and something that's meant to be played and have fun with and um you know that was something my parents tried their best to remind me of and I sometimes would hear and sometimes wouldn't but it would be just to go have fun right go have fun you know the the especially when it comes to the games right you can train and you can sort of practice but then when it comes to the moment of actually stepping onto the court how do you just go play and do what you know how to do and and just enjoy that as best you can and i know it's cliche and i know it's something we hear enough or we hear a lot but i don't think we can hear it enough and it's cliche for a reason because i think it's so true and you know even the idea of like yeah being a parent and a new parent and seeing a baby like babies just love to just play i mean there's just this this nature it's a nature inside of us and there's you know good research around that this idea that like one of our our we're wired to play and i think not and and sort of that competitiveness can sometimes outweigh that and so i think for me just being able to remind myself of that um was really important i think it helped me a lot when i was playing and even today i think it's still an important part of self-care I want to put play in that plant, the one that's like green and blue and has the heart in the middle there. I want to put one of those, one of those, I think I need to add play in there. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Even like the, I suppose even the word that maybe evokes more what I'm saying is playfulness. Playfulness. Like, I don't know. There's something yeah. different there about it, but just like playfulness, being playful. Yeah. Um, yeah, play, the, play kind of has this preconceived notion of like, oh, go play, right? We're playing. But I think playfulness evokes sort of more of a lightheartedness, more of a, a, that, that playful spirit, I think that I'm trying to mention too. And that's another, it's a huge buffer for things like burnout and it enhances enjoyment, right? And creativity and connection. And I love that. Okay. Well, Emma, we got a splash play all over the place. Playfulness, sorry, all over the place. I play spot too. <laughs> that's awesome. Thanks, Derek. So yeah, and it kind of, yeah, it, it fits in the resilience piece. It fits in the wellness piece, um, self-care planning. I hope that for everybody who's been, been watching this tonight or who's watching it recorded, picked up something that really resonated with them that they'll be able to take back and either use themselves, or if you're someone who's in charge of others and you're a coach or your parent, able to apply some of this to that young person in your life that's playing right now we're coming into playoffs and, and and exam times and managing some rocky um or choppy waters hope that you'll pick something up from this evening and if you have any additional questions i know i don't know if we had any pop up tonight emma but there's i just no, i just put forward the ones that i had come through to me so okay. well, i think we're we're pretty good on that front okay. but yeah Fantastic. that was awesome I know that we've got a ton of people who also re requested this as a recording and it will be going on our YouTube channel. So um, we'll be able to share it with coaches in particular and and parents as they can support their, their young people as we head into the most stressful part of the season for yeah. everybody. Exactly. Yeah, so I guess that's for me to wrap up or did you have any last comments or points, Sean or Derek? No, just wanted to hold the floor in case there was something that came to you directly as a as a DM that we wanted to address tonight, because otherwise, really just encouraging everyone to go and take a look at some of the tools and resources that we've already pulled together. And uh, but of course, if there if there are any other questions, or if, if someone wants to um, send something along, I guess there'd be some channels that they could contact you, Emma. 
Absolutely. So anyone who registered for this recording will receive the link tomorrow with the recording. And then it will be also providing the PowerPoint slides as well, as usual. Um, and then it will go up on our website and on our YouTube channel, as I mentioned. So I guess it just remains to say thank you, Shauna, and thank you, Derek, and a belated thank you to Shanice, who had to leave us. Um, but that was another awesome session, and that will conclude our series for this part of the season. But I'm sure we will be back later, and that is a, a, a plug also to everybody who's watching this to let us know if there are other topics or themes that you would like to hear from, because um, these have had such great reception from people, and I know that there are a lot of other hot topics that often bubble to the surface. So if you do want to hear about what, something that's specific, please send either myself an email or to our communications at volleyballbc.org and um, we will endeavor to put it on as, as we keep unfolding these webinars. So thanks everyone for joining us and a huge thank you to you, Shauna, and also to Derek for coming on and participating this evening. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. Good evening. Bye. Bye, Bye for now.